Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends Annual. Hello, I'm Edward, and I'm very excited about being asked to introduce the new Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends Annual. There isn't a story about me in the annual this year, so the Fat Controller said I could do this special welcome to you instead. The Fat Controller knows he can always rely on me to be sensible, and I hope he is pleased with my introduction. I'm glad to see that my good friend Duck is welcomed back to the yard, when Henry, Gordon, and James all realize that Duck has not been calling them names after all. I never believed that Duck would do such a thing, no great western engine would be as rude as that. Anyway, I am always very glad to see Duck when he comes to help me, particularly in summertime, when we are busy with the seaside visitors and the china clay trucks that Bill and Ben bring down to the harbor. I get rushed off my wheels, I can tell you. There are lots of stories for you to enjoy. Donald and Douglas help a new signalman, and Percy saves the day, or should I say party, at Christmas. Thomas has been having trouble with birds, and poor Birdie has a breakdown. Inside, you will find pictures of your favorite engines, too. And, with puzzles to do, and pictures to color, a quiz, and lots more, you'll want to turn the pages and start having fun, so I'll get back to my branch line. Peep, peep, goodbye. Percy and the Vicar's Prizes One evening, a few days before Christmas, the Fat Controller visited the engine shed at Farquhar. Thomas, Toby, Percy, and Daisy eyed him expectantly. We are all going to be busy over Christmas, the Fat Controller announced. Yes, sir. Please, sir, interrupted Percy excitedly. We always are, sir. The other engines hushed him, but the Fat Controller smiled. Quite so, Percy, he said, but this year there will be extra trains. There are Sunday school specials, the Fat Controller went on. All the Sunday schools in the valley are having one big party in the village near the river. Daisy is to bring the children from lower down the valley, while Thomas, Annie, and Clarabelle will take the children who live here. Toby and Henrietta will follow Thomas down the line with the children who cannot fit into Annie and Clarabelle. "'What about me, sir?' asked Percy. "'Can I help, too?' The Fat Controller laughed. "'You will be needed to make sure things run smoothly here, Percy,' he said." keeping the trucks in order, and so on. Yes, sir, said Percy sadly. He thought staying in the yard sounded rather dull. On the morning of the party, the sky looked dark and threatening. Thomas's driver was anxious about the weather, but the snow held off. Annie and Clarabel were waiting at the platform when the vicar arrived with the first group of children. He was carrying a brown suitcase. Chattering excitedly, the children climbed into the train. Thomas puffed off proudly. They made good time down the valley, though the sky was getting darker. That snow won't hold off much longer, said Thomas's driver. They reached the station by the river just as Daisy arrived from the opposite direction. The vicar guided all the noisy children towards the gate. Suddenly, he turned looking worried. My case, he exclaimed. Has anyone seen my suitcase? Is it a brown one? asked Thomas's driver. There was a case left at Farquhar Station. Oh dear, said the vicar. That is awful. All the prizes for the party are inside that case. Could Thomas fetch it, do you think? Perhaps Toby could bring it, suggested the driver, but just then a whistle in the distance told them that Toby had already left. What about Percy? suggested Thomas. I don't suppose he would mind leaving his shunting for a bit. Well done, Thomas, said his driver, and ran to find a telephone. As he did so, big flakes of snow began to fall. The snow got thicker and thicker as they waited for Percy to arrive. The vicar paced the platform anxiously, leaving a trail of footprints backwards and forwards. Thomas grew anxious, too, but there was still no sign of Percy. The vicar looked at his watch in desperation. It's no use, he said sadly. Thank you for trying, but I shall have to go to the party without the presents. As he reached the gate, they all heard a faint whistle in the distance. A moment later, Percy bustled importantly round the curve and drew up behind Henrietta. I'm not late, am I? Percy asked anxiously as his driver took a large brown suitcase from his cab. This is what you want, I think, his driver smiled. It is indeed, agreed the vicar. Thank you, Percy. This is the best Christmas present you could give to anyone. 
He turned and rushed happily away to the party. The party was a great success, and when the children went home, they sang carols so loudly that Thomas and Percy could hear them. The engines forgot how tired they were and joined in. The fat controller was very pleased. We are here to serve the public, he told the three engines and Daisy, and it is at times like this that we prove how well we can do that. Thomas, Percy, Toby, and Daisy, I am proud of you. A very happy Christmas to you all. A Problem for the Twins Edward's branch line is single, with a passing place about halfway along. Usually the trains that run along the line are short enough to pass each other there. But one day, Donald had a long train of empty trucks, which his driver knew would be too long to fit into the passing loop, where they were due to cross Douglas with a loaded train. I just hope he hasn't got too many trucks, said Donald's driver. Donald reached the loop first and stopped. A few minutes later, Douglas appeared in the distance, coming slowly down the hill. Oh dear, remarks Donald's fireman, he's got a long train too. Now what shall we do? The signalman stopped Douglas before he entered the loop. It's a pity you couldn't have left a couple of trucks behind, he remarked to Douglas's driver. Now, how are you going to get past? Donald and Douglas looked at the signalman pityingly. Ugh, no problem said Douglas. "'Tis nothing compared with some of the going-ons on our old line, eh, Donald?' "'Aye,' agreed Donald. "'Why, Douglas does not even have to uncouple fra his train.' "'Well, I'm blowed if I see how,' said the signalman, scratching his head. The two drivers held a quick conference to decide what to do. "'Leave it to us,' they told the signalman. "'Just change the points when we signal, right, but don't change anything for the moment.' Carefully, Donald backed his train of empty trucks some way beyond the points. Then, the firemen got out and uncoupled the rear half of the train. Donald came forward again and stopped in the loop. Now Douglas drew forward and ran right through the loop until his train was clear of the points, and he had reached the empty trucks Donald had left behind. Donald's driver waved to the signalman to change the points, and then ran a little way up the hill. Then he stopped and waited. The signalman changed the points again. Meanwhile, Douglas's firemen had coupled up to Donald's empties. Douglas drew back and uncoupled them in the loop. Then he carried on backwards until he was clear of the points. His driver shouted to the signalman to change them, and Douglas, with the clear loop in front of him, puffed away with the triumphant toot of his whistle. The signalman could see what was wanted now. He straightened the points without being told so that Donald could back on to his empty trucks, couple up, and continue his journey. The twins had a good laugh in the shed that night. Ugh, aye, they chuckled. We surely taught that signalman something, eh? Thomas and the Swans One day, Percy was bringing some trucks from the harbor. Suddenly, a bird flew out of the bracken and hit Percy's buffer beam with a thump. Ouch! exclaimed Percy. He wasn't hurt, but the poor bird fell beside the line. They stopped, and the driver put the bird in his cab. It had been badly hurt, and they decided to take it to the vet. Driver thought it was a pheasant, Percy told Thomas sadly. It scared me, bursting out of the hedge like that. Pooh, scoffed Thomas. Poor little Percy. Fancy being frightened by a bird. If I met a bird like that, I'd just blow steam at it. A few weeks later, Thomas saw a flock of large white birds flying across the railway, their necks stretched far ahead of their strongly beating wings. He wondered what they were. They're swans, said his driver. Swans were royal birds once, and some still belong to the queen. What does she want them for? Thomas asked. And why are they here? Did she bring them when she came to see our railway last year? His driver laughed. No, Thomas, he said, only the swans on the river near her castle belong to her. But all swans are protected birds. That means no one must hurt them. But what if we ran into one of them by accident, like Percy's pheasant, said Thomas. The driver scratched his head. I don't know, he said. I think I'd rather not find out. Next day, Thomas stopped for water at the station by the river. As the water gurgled into his tank, Thomas saw something ahead of him on the bridge. It looked like an old newspaper. 
It's a very clean old newspaper, thought Thomas as he started away, but his driver had noticed it too. Suddenly, he put on the brakes. When they stopped, Thomas realized that it wasn't a newspaper. He was face to face with a large, very cross swan. Sss, said the swan. Oof, exclaimed Thomas in alarm. His driver and fireman climbed down from the cab and went carefully forward. The swan struggled to its feet and came towards them. Thomas tried to back away, but he couldn't. His driver and fireman had problems of their own. The swan arched its neck and spread one wing wide. Sss, it said again. Thomas jumped and let off steam. This made the swan crosser than ever, and it pecked at Thomas's driver. The driver and fireman hurried back towards the cab. The driver climbed up while the fireman went back to the station for help. The bird has a broken wing by the look of it, the driver explained. It flew into the parapet of the bridge, I expect. The station master telephoned a vet who, with a friend and some difficulty, managed to carefully move the swan and clear the line. I thought you weren't scared of birds, said Percy in the shed that night. Thomas smiled knowingly. I wasn't scared. I was just being careful, Thomas replied. Why, it might have been one of the Queen's own swans. You wouldn't have wanted me to hurt that, would you? The Railway Quiz Here is a very simple railway quiz based on Thomas the Tank Engine and his friends. To help you, we have pictured six of the engines featured in the answers. To see how many questions you have got right, turn to pages 60 to 61 for the answers. Who was called Rusty Red Scrap Iron? Which engine is number 10? How many wheels has Henry got? What is Toby's coach called? Who got fish in his water tank? What number is Percy? What does Trevor like doing best? Who ran off a turntable into a ditch? Who once had a race with Percy? Who was pushed out of a tunnel by an elephant? Bertie to the rescue. We've got an excursion tomorrow, Bertie's driver said one evening. Bertie was pleased. He spent most of his time running between Thomas's station and the villages, so a trip to somewhere new made a nice change. Are we taking children to the seaside? He asked eagerly. No, said his driver. It's a group of climbers who want to go to the lake in the hills for a picnic, so make sure you rest your engine ready for tomorrow. But Bertie's engine wouldn't start when they awoke next day. His driver tried everything he could to make Bertie's engine better, but it was no use, so Bertie's friend Algie had to collect the climbers instead. Algie arrived on time, and they all set off happily. But when they had done half their journey, Algie had to stop at some traffic lights. While they waited, Algie's engine stopped, and, try as he might, his driver could not start it again. Would you mind helping me push Algy out of the way? The driver asked the passengers. We can't hold up the traffic like this. The passengers were pleased to help. They pushed as hard as they could and, in a cloud of white smoke, managed to get Algy started. Algy's driver went on very carefully, never letting the engine run slowly, until, at last, late but safe, they reached their destination. From a nearby house, the driver telephoned the garage to tell them what had happened, and the group of climbers ate their lunch. Then, while they climbed the hills and walked in the woods, Algy's driver tried to repair him. He worked hard all afternoon. Again and again, he tried to start Algy's engine, but it was no use. Then, when there was only an hour to go before it was time to start for home, he went to the telephone once more. Sorry, said the man at the garage. Bertie is still not well, but we'll do what we can. A little while later, tired after their day in the hills, the climbers returned to Algy the bus for their journey home. They were surprised to see Algy's driver still trying to make his bus start. Shall we push you again? They asked wearily. I don't think that will help now, said Algy's driver sadly. I can't get him to work at all. How long will it take for another bus to come up here and collect us? The climbers asked anxiously. I'm afraid there isn't another bus, said Algy's driver. That's the trouble. Bertie's out of action as well, but I rang for help an hour ago. At that very moment, they heard the toot of a familiar horn in the distance, and soon, who should appear round the corner but Bertie? Hop in, he said cheerily, as he stopped beside Algy and the climbers. Drivers mended me, and now I feel fine. We'll have you home before you can say Birdie the Bus.
galloping sausage. Duck was tired. He had been working hard, and he needed to rest in the big shed. But James was blocking his way. Go away, James hissed crossly. You can't come in. Why? Protested Duck. The trucks say you have been calling me names," said James furiously. "They say you called me Rusty Red Scrap Iron." "I didn't," said Duck. "And you called me Old Square Wheels," interrupted Henry. "Diesel told me this morning." "I haven't called any of you names," insisted Duck. "I think Devious Diesel is just telling tales to get me in trouble." Duck sighed. But James and Henry didn't believe Duck. Duck was sad and trundled away to spend the night in a siding. Diesel was delighted. His trick had worked. He had disliked Duck ever since his first morning in the yard when Duck told him to fetch some trucks. But Diesel had not listened properly. He collected the wrong ones, and the fat controller was very cross. Diesel chuckled to himself when he saw Duck next morning. Right, he said in an oily voice. Now Henry and James are on my side. What can I do about Gordon? I wonder. A few days later, he heard some trucks talking in the yard. Gordon thinks he can go much faster than anything else. They chattered. But how can he? He's old. Not as old as me. Wheezed an elderly guards van who had come from the other railway many years before. I remember the days on my old line when some of the big engines like Gordon were named after horses which had won a race called the Derby. Lemberg was one, and Pretty Polly was another. What a silly name for an engine! The trucks laughed. Have you noticed? Said a small truck that Gordon looks as if he's galloping when he's coming straight towards you, just like a horse. He chuckled mischievously. That's to do with the way his side rods are attached to his wheels. Diesel explained as he purred away. He thought about the trucks' conversation that day as he shunted. Next morning, the weather grew very hot. Heat haze shimmered around the boilers of Henry and Gordon as they stood outside the shed. Henry had just had his water tank filled and was moving away from the water tower. Gordon did not need water, but he had to pass the water tower to get to the station. As he did so, water from the dripping water hose splashed onto his boiler, which was so hot that the water sizzled and popped, just like sausages frying in a pan. Remarked Diesel's driver. Diesel smiled to himself. He had just had an idea. Do you know what Duck said about Gordon? Diesel whispered to the trucks the next day. Before the trucks could reply, Diesel continued. Duck says Gordon looks like a galloping sausage. The trucks tittered. You shouldn't laugh," said Diesel sternly. Duck was being very rude. But trucks don't care about good manners. Soon the galloping sausage story had spread all round the yard, and worst of all, everyone thought that Duck had started the story. It was not long, of course, before Gordon heard what was being said about him. As Diesel expected, Gordon was furious. Galloping sausage! He snorted indignantly. I've never been so insulted in my life. What do you mean by it, Duck? I'm sorry, Gordon," said Duck. "I don't know anything about it." Gordon let off steam loudly. "That's what you said to James and Henry," he hissed. "The trucks all say it's you." Diesel says he's asked them about it. Didn't you, Diesel? Diesel agreed. "I'm a strong engine," said Gordon proudly. "Not a galloping sausage." Duck went sadly away to find his next train, and a few days later, the fat controller sent him away to help Edward on his branch line. The fat controller didn't like his railway to be disrupted by silly stories. He intended to find out which engine was making all the trouble, and when the silly stories were still being told after Duck had gone, he knew which engine was to blame. The fat controller had to sort everything out and wasted no time. He spoke to Diesel, who was sent away in disgrace, and soon after that, Duck came back. Duck was given a great welcome by the other engines. "We're sorry we didn't listen to you," they said. "Please forgive us." Duck did, of course, and now I'm glad to say all the engines are the best of friends again. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to watch future videos. Signing off for now, Wooden Toby.